Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending the fourth installment of our Corona Correction webinar series, FCPA Compliance in the Era of COVID-19, Minimizing Pandemic-Related Corruption Risk. My name is Karin Rines, and I'm the Marketing Manager for the Risk Business at Refinitiv. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. First, just some technical points to note. There's no dial-in number for the audio, so please use your device's sound and plug in your headphones to listen to this webinar. Click on the media player on your screen to enable sound and ensure that flash is enabled on your browser. Also, if your slides get stuck, please refresh your browser. This will usually unlock it. You can expand your slide window by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right side of the slide window or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area to expand and make that window larger. At the bottom of your audience console screen, you'll see a toolbar with multiple widgets. If you have any technical difficulty during this webcast, please click on the help widget, which is the yellow question mark. This will cover common technical issues may, you may run across. Our presenters will answer audience questions at the end of the presentation. At the top right corner of your audience console is a Q&A box. Please submit your questions in this box. Finally, the link to the recorded webcast, a copy of the slides, and other resources will be emailed to you after the conclusion of this event. You may also access the webcast on demand using the same audience link and email address that you use today. Our panelists today are Kevin Bogdanov, who is the Performance Director of in the Americas for Refinitiv. Julie DeMauro is a Regulatory Intelligence Expert at, at Thomson Reuters. And Scott Roybal is the Practice Group Leader of Government Contracts, Investigations, and International Trade Practice Group at Shepherd Mullins. Full bios of all our speakers can be found on your audience console screen. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it on over to Kevin to get the Ooh, excuse me, get the discussion started. Kevin? Thank you so much, Karen, and hello, everybody, and welcome to part four of our COVID-19 series uh, here at Refinitiv. We're very glad to have you join us, and obviously, we hope that your families are safe and healthy and well uh, during what's been a truly unprecedented time, and we were just reflecting a moment ago uh, some of the profound changes it's had on all of us as, as uh, family members, uh, as business professionals, and certainly as compliance practitioners in this time. Uh, and so it goes without saying that these are uncharted waters, not just for us uh, and our families as individuals, but also uh, that they represent a very unique time for our business environment, uh, where compliance has quite a unique role in holding the line, ensuring sustainable ethical business practices, and, and often under a great deal of economic uncertainty and economic pressure. So we're going to explore all this. We're going to touch on some of the challenges, what we can do to think about and approach them uh, with key takeaways and next steps. And we're also going to think about some of the changing regulatory expectation and what kind of guidance and tone we've heard from some of the key regulators. So I'm really pleased to invite both Julie and Scott to join us today. Both have a tremendous amount of background and experience, particularly in the anti-bribery, anti-corruption and FCPO space. Uh, they've both been published. They both had extensive practice expertise, and so I really welcome both of them. Uh, Julie, Scott, thanks so much for joining us. Really glad to have you today. Good to be here, Kevin. So, Happy to be here. Thank you. Thrilled. No, my absolute pleasure. So, 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 Scott, I'm going to start with you, and maybe it just helps to kind of set the stage a little bit and think about where we've started uh, and where we've come from as we think about next steps. So can you maybe tee us off a little bit and help us think about where we've come from and some of the lay of the land from an FCPA standpoint pre-coronavirus? Sure. Um, so before the, the stealthy and deadly COVID-19 virus turned the world upside down, the U.S. Department of Justice and the Securities Exchange Commission enforcement duo had openly served notice um, that it was busily engaged in targeting and prosecuting a record number of companies and individuals for a wide variety and range of violations of the FCPA's anti-bribery and accounting provisions. Um, as we all know, uh, the FCPA is the United States' weapon of choice when it comes to combating bribery and corruption of foreign officials around the world. In recent months, um, we've all kind of been tuned in to the news events, and we've been listening about curves and flattening curves in connection with combating the COVID-19 virus. Well, over the past 10 years, 
the FCPA enforcement trends and statistics have established kind of their own curve of sorts. It resembles uh, a bathtub curve. Uh, going back to 2010, 2011, uh, the DOJ and SEC claimed some of their highest enforcement totals um, since the inception of that statute in 1977. Then in 2012 through 2015, there was a little bit of a tapering or flattening of the curve, so to speak. Uh, but more recently, uh, in the years 2016 through 2019, there's been a substantial spike in the enforcement curve, um, all culminating in 2019 with record numbers of prosecutions and fines that we'll discuss in a little bit more detail later on the call. So for me, um, there are a couple of significant takeaways from this pre-COVID FCPA environment or enforcement trend. First, there was a statistically significant uptick um, in FCPA enforcement after the last worldwide crisis. Uh, as you all know, the financial meltdown or recession of 2008-2009. And much of that uptick uh, was driven by the DOJ and SEC's post-mortem examination of books and records of companies under the accounting provisions of the FCPA that later led to enforcement actions against uh, many companies uh, coming later in 2010, 2012. That was in large part responsible for that uptick. The second uh, takeaway that I have is, um, suffice it to say that right now, heading into this crisis, the DOJ and SEC are on a four-year roll of historic record enforcement, and there's really no reason to believe that they're gonna be slowing down anytime soon. Now, some of that's responsible for uh, the policy changes at DOJ in 2017, which you see reflected in the lower left uh, corner of the slide. It discusses the voluntary disclosure and cooperation programs, uh, credits on sentencing guidelines, and that if you get in there early, disclose and try to take care of uh, remediation and settlements, that uh, you will get your uh, criminal declinations and so on and so forth. So that no doubt uh, spurred a little bit of an uptick uh, in you know, 17 through 19. So in fact, if we can say past this prologue uh, leading into the current environment, we should expect the FCPA enforcement curve to spike even further in the wake of the current pandemic crisis, which is being fueled by historic government spending and commercial pursuit of critical health products and supplies uh, that are really desperately needed around the world. That's great. Thanks, Scott. And so I think before we explore the question of whether there's another bathtub on the way uh, or whether, to your point, we might be seeing sustained and ongoing levels of scrutiny uh, and sort of think about some of the guidance that's been coming down from the regulators, and I think a really helpful place to start as to what this new normal means and how we should think about it is kind of the impact that it's had on our business environment. Uh, we'll then sort of touch on what it means for us as professionals and compliance and how we think about next steps. But, you know, Julie, I kind of want to turn to you. So, you know, here we are. You know, the last month has unfolded before us and we're kind of in this new normal. And so what happens now? So what are the kind of the, the next steps, if you will, and how has COVID-19 reshaped the business environment for compliance professionals? Absolutely. So like uh, Scott was just mentioning global supply chain risk, and it, given the pandemic, companies are converting their businesses and need new supplies to produce new inventory. And there are risks involved in that because of where the items might be located, who can provide them, and maybe your team doesn't have the same type of bandwidth for sufficient due diligence that it used to have, maybe being distracted by other things or having a workforce that's been impacted by the pandemic, hopefully not, but health-wise. Um, so there are a lot of challenges going on here. And again, a lot of the risk involved here with FCPA is you are trying to find supplies in a region controlled by uh, where, uh, you know, uh, um, companies, businesses are controlled by the government, either partly or fully. Um, so you're dealing with government officials to get those products. Uh, it puts you at risk of FCPA violations excuse me, among other forms of corruption. So, so that's the problem. And then, but why we know the regulators are still focused on fraud right now, uh, even though they're dealing with other things, comes from a number of different uh, forms of proof or things that, with trends that we've seen. So there's been aggressive enforcement in the last 10 years. Um, and, uh, and even during the financial crisis in 08, uh, they were still you know, very proactive in the fraud corruption space. So there's no reason to believe they'll be soft on businesses now. Um, also, there's just bipartisan and strong public support 
for anti-corruption initiatives against companies, um, especially when it comes to propping up dictators or other corrupt public officials um, ab abroad. So we've seen a lot of proof of that. But more recently, we've had uh, Attorney General Barr, um, who's come out to urge the American public to report COVID-19 fraud. Um, there are a number of hotlines that you can use to report it. Um, and he's directed the U.S. attorneys um, across the nation to prioritize the investigation and prosecution of coronavirus-related fraud schemes. Um, and he has set up a coronavirus fraud coordinator um, to deal with matters relating to the coronavirus. Uh, there's a hoarding and price gouging task force. And DOJ set up this task force to work with law enforcement partners to ensure uh, that bad actors don't profit illicitly from the pandemic when it comes to supplies critical to the COVID-19 response effort. Um, and then, you know, around uh, 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 the country, uh, New, it's like New York's Attorney General Letitia James I have down here, but other Attorney Generals, um, it, issuing cease and desist orders early on um, to companies um, it, that are marketing like supposed treatments to COVID-19. Uh, they've uh, done a lot of outreach to consumers about investment in charity scams, that type of thing. Um, the SEC has warned people about being uh, able to see new revised material, non oh, material non-public information. Um, it's just raising the red flag about uh, illegally traded securities that mm. some people might be a little bit more privy to those uh, material non-public information details uh, and use it, um, uh, you know, in, in an illegal legal manner. So raising people's awareness, businesses uh, being more aware of uh, the misuse of that uh, MNPI, as we call it. So, um, so just mentioning a number of those initiatives to point out that uh, you know, the, the regulators haven't taken their foot off the gas in terms of looking for corruption and fraud, paying a lot of attention to the FCPA specifically, and making sure the businesses haven't uh, you know, taken their eye off the, off the ball as well. That's great. Thanks, Julie. And so, you know, if I could just sort of uh, react to what you're saying, it sounds like there's a lot of pressure coming from a lot of different places. And so I imagine, you know, you guys on the call here, as you're listening to some of this, you're thinking, well, great, I've got risk in my supply chain. I'm on, I'm on the guard for fraud. Uh, there's sort of public and, and regulatory and government focus around this. Oh, and by the way, you know, some of you might be in sectors that are under extreme economic pressure where there's probably more pressure than ever before to push deals forward. Uh, to secure contracts through agents, through third parties, distributors, whatever the case may be. So it feels like you're being attacked on all sides. And so, Julia, I suppose in response to that, you know, because you're under pressure and you're trying to maintain continuity plans, you've got virtual staff and you're juggling all these priorities, where does anti-bribery, anti-corruption fit into that bigger picture? How do you start to think about that in that context? Absolutely. It has to be a part of your business continuity program. And I mean, here you are dealing with this um, BCP that you're putting into place that is taking into account things that we've never had to take in, into account before, like social distancing entered our lexicon all of a sudden, and we had to put that into our crisis management program. So it is, it is a challenge. Um, it's a new emergency scenario, and gaps in a plan can arise. Um, businesses at least need to know who and which departments are responsible for filling certain gaps in the plan, again, because this is a unique situation, so at least knowing who's doing what to address the situation very early on is critical so that you can have uh, different people um, coordinating, working together. Um, who communicates well-prepared messaging to stakeholders is extremely important, which includes your customers, employees, and suppliers. Um, that coordinated messaging is extremely important. Um, and an important question to consider is, can your managers and compliance team adequately monitor for corruption risk with work from home arrangements? It makes it a little bit more challenging. You can if internal controls are working. Independent reviews are expen of expenditures are still being done. There's spot checking of transactions. Behaviors are being monitored, which can help with some red tech tools help you with that. And a speak up culture is emphasized um, so that, you know, there's still that uh, emphasis on uh, using hotlines, whistleblower hotlines, on reporting abuse or suspected abuse. Um, Post-COVID, the crisis plan and all fraud risk assessments made 
should be reviewed. So just looking down the road, everything that you've been putting together in terms of this business continuity program, there should be a, do a double check, a review session to fine tune, possibly with outside expertise involved, to audit the system and guide your business in the future. But, um, you know, it, all of this is important and, and, you know, some of that's down the road. But for now, it's very important, important that there's, uh, you know, uh, in, roles are, are very well defined, communication is consistent, and also have backups for important personnel. Sometimes that is a missing component of BCPs. You just don't think people are going to get sick. They're young and healthy. Um, but things can happen, and it's very important that uh, integral persons in your uh, business have a, a backup uh, that can step in and, and take over the reins. So those are a few of the main points I wanted to pull out from here. Thanks, Julie. I mean, look, it really takes a village, right? This is sort of a universal accountability and, and challenge that stems from the first, second, and third line of defense. It sort of really takes a broad swath of stakeholders and business groups to address it. Uh, that said, you know, Scott, if I could turn to you, I think sometimes it's helpful to think about our role in this, you know, and we as compliance professionals, again, have such a significant role to play to ensure that all of these checks and balances remain in place and we are sustaining sound business practice. So what does that look like, Scott? I mean, what are some of the key things that we need to think about and what role do, do we play in this business response? Uh, yes, uh, Kevin. Um, and my remarks here are, are not going to be new or novel to our listeners because I know you're all uh, you know, relatively sophisticated uh, legal and compliance and related type professionals. Uh, but I think my, my response here is for all of us, a reminder for all of us to uh, stay focused, focused on those things that we know are critical uh, to what we bring to bear uh, to the company. Uh, so just three really short points. Uh, we need to continue to be trusted advisors. Um, so as legal and compliance professionals, uh, as mentioned, uh, we are really integral to the culture of compliance and business ethics and codes of conduct, and really at bottom, protecting the business and the shareholder. Um, right now, uh, during this craziness, uh, now is not the time to uh, be distracted uh, or be on the sidelines. Uh, it's time to be close to the business, um, close and embedded, and uh, and basically gain their trust and confidence so they can view you as their trusted advisors. Now, having said that, the second point is, it's more important than ever that we as legal and compliance professionals, even though we're close to the business, uh, and that's where we should be, facially, we must still be independent and objective. Um, we just can't allow ourselves to be influenced by finances, revenues, in an environment of in, you know, really intense economic pressures uh, where companies are focusing on spending, cost reductions. Look, it, it, it's happening everywhere. I, I sit in partners meetings at my law firm and we have offices around the globe and uh, we listen to our management speak and look, every business out there right now is talking about spending, overhead cost reductions, where can we cut costs in 2019, so A, to stay alive or so that we don't have a disastrous year. So that's, that's part of the reality of uh, the COVID crisis. So really, it's a balancing act. It's a balancing act between staying close with your, with your, with your clients, your in-house internal clients, and yet bringing that independence and objective um, viewpoint, which kind of goes to my, my third and uh, last point on this subject is that during this really complex and uncertain time, we have to be proactive, uh, proactive in terms of preventing and detecting you know, potential uh, pitfalls that are out there. So while the business in all likelihood is laser focused on the here and the now, how are we going to survive this week, next week, this month? you know, Q2, Q3, Q4, I mean, that's where their focus is uh, on the business and the revenues. We have to be there with them. We're part of that team as well. But we also, in our roles, have to have a vision over the horizon. We have to be looking out over the horizon for these various FCPA pitfalls and bring that to bear um, in a timely and uh, responsible way to uh, 
to our customers and clients. That's really helpful uh, from both of you. Thank you so much. And so it's certainly a lot to think about. Uh, I do want to go back to the, the discussion we started on earlier, but, but now can sort of touch on a little more and dive into a little bit, which is what that then means from a regulatory expectation standpoint. What are the regulators communicating, expecting? What, what are the changing dynamics that they're sort of undergoing right now? And, and Scott, you know, we talked a little bit about the bathtub before, so I, I suppose here it is, right? The, the sort of the orange and the yellow uh, graph here where you see year-on-year -year, uh, enforcement spanning the DOJ and the SEC, uh, sort of highlighting your comment earlier. Um, and so, you know, let's kind of start with that baseline again. And so, you know, it, not only did we see very high levels of enforcement, but we also saw some of the largest really historic um, individual enforcements coming off from very recently uh, through 2019 and onwards. So what does that mean? What, what, what does that reflect, if you will, on that expectation from these regulators uh, what are we sort of coming in, what vantage point from, if you will? Sure. Um, so let's just take stock of a couple of the highlights. So, of course, um, 2019, for those that are basically kind of watching watching the movement of the, the, the needles and the graphs out there, was certainly a banner year for DOJ and SEC, uh, where they basically uh, raked in in excess of $2.6 billion in, in fines and penalties. Now, uh, to put that uh, in, in a little bit more uh, further context, um, a lot of that was driven by a couple of uh, really, really big uh, settlements. Uh, so, we, you know, we have Ericsson that uh, paid in, in excess of a uh, billion dollars along with the Deferred Prosecution Agreement and uh, Mobile Telesystems, MTS, also uh, kicked in $850 million along with a, a DPA as well. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of, I guess, takeaways from, from each of these events that I think are kind of indicative of enforcement in general. So with respect to the, the Ericsson matter, um, there were allegations that there were third-party agents um, receiving payments for quote-unquote corporate marketing fees that uh, allegedly um, were used to facilitate corrupt payments to government officials in a variety of countries, not in just one spot, China, Djibouti, Indonesia, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Vietnam. Another interesting point of fact here is these payments uh, were basically doled out, according to the regulators, over a huge period of time, from 2000 to 2017. So that just kind of shows you the staying power that DOJ and SEC have and the doggedness that they will um, bring to bear. Um, they, will, they will basically focus on you and it's not just an episodic one month, one year, two year, three year sort of an undertaking. They will keep peeling the onion until they feel like they've, they've uh, basically you know, covered, covered their bases. Uh, you know, with respect to MTS, uh, that was a little bit different twist. Uh, those were payments to the daughter of the late uh, Uzbek president uh, to facilitate access allegedly to the Uzbek telecom market. And interestingly on this one, it was a spinoff from another investigation, in fact, a series of investigations that basically dated back to the early 2000s. So really, when you look at these two big hitters, so to speak, they had their, basically their roots, their germination, way back in the early 2000s, but then just came to, to a head in 2019. So that's something to keep in mind, that sometimes these things can marinate, marinate for a long, long time, um, and it just goes to show you that the SEC and the DOJ are willing to invest the time and effort and energy um, to bring these sorts of uh, results to bear. Now, what are some of the key factors that we can learn, say, in this 10-year swath in terms of trends, which I personally don't believe are going to abate anytime soon, and I think these several trends are here to stay, and they're actually going to be a little bit of a roadmap uh, for things to come. So. What's responsible for these record uh, settlements? Well, there's something called FCPA clusters. Uh, DOJ and SEC uh, now have a, a pattern and practice of turning singular investigations into multiples, sometimes myriad enforcement actions over years. So what do I mean by that? Um, you know, back in the day, they might just focus on and charge the company and just leave it at that. Uh, and then work the company and then go on to another one. But now they're charging both companies and one or more of its employees 
or agents or third parties. It's not just the companies anymore. It's everybody in and around the companies, including the individuals. Also, they tend to use what they call the hub effect, which is they use one entity at the center, the targeted activity, and then they basically spoke out from that and they start tying and connecting the dots to multiple companies. A classic example um, of this, uh, which has really now been going on for the better part of the decade, uh, is the Petrobras um, investigations known as Operation Car Wash, involving the Brazilian oil services cases really starting back in 2010. And believe it or not, the DOJ and SEC are still netting multiple charges each year over the past four years, including several in 2019, and apparently there are still investigations ongoing in that case. So again, uh, long term, and they just kind of keep peeling the onion, if you will. Also, they will develop industry practice tactics as well. So, so for example, some of you may have heard of the princeling industry practice uh, that they targeted. And that's where basically companies hire the children of government officials for so-called internships. Uh, and this was particularly prevalent um, in the banking sector. And once they had kind of refined that industry practice of the princeling investigations, they kind of overlaid that across many, many banking institutions, financial institutions, and got a bigger bang for their buck. So looking forward, we have to kind of keep our mind on what's the next industry practice they're going to be looking at. Well, we've alluded to it a little bit, and we'll talk about it some more, but basically the mad scramble glo globally and worldwide for shortages of personal protective equipment, um, medical supplies, drugs, ingredients, ventilators, testing kits, um, and really there, there, there are shortages all over the world. So just think about that high demand, shortages, and what it's going to take for the buyer and the seller to get together and come out on top and get those sales. So you can see there where the DOJ and the SEC's wheels might be spinning to generate the next type of industry practice enforcement tactic. Now that's FCPA clusters. Secondly, the SEC has developed aggressive theories in their books and records under the accounting provisions. They tend to look very hard now into vague entries in your books and your entries under the accounting provisions. So, for example, there was recent enforcement involving transactions um, that involved Cuba and a Cuba state-owned telecom company. But when the SEC started looking at the books and records, they saw that the, the word or the name Cuba was never entered, but they were using generic terms and cryptic terms like broker or customer's initials. This just points out that it's more important than ever to be very accurate and complete in your entries in your books and records because the SEC is becoming very, very aggressive, they're not just looking for the overt lie or misrepresentation. They're looking for obfuscation, vagueness, ambiguity, and then they're going to take that and run with it. So that's another factor that's uh, occurred. And then finally, and this one might be the most powerful of all, it's known as the FCPA-related charges tactics by the DOJ, where they're now pairing typical or traditional FCPA investigations with money laundering, wire fraud, and mail fraud. Things that you would see more typically under the Bank Secrecy Act, the BSA, FinCEN reporting, anti-money laundering statutes, KYC, knowing your customers. So all those things that our financial institutions and others um, know very well in the BSA, FinCEN, AML, and KYC world, DOJ is now pairing those with the FCPA to get a bigger bang or their effort. And what they're doing is they will um, oftentimes bring the money laundering, wire fraud, and mail fraud charges against the foreign person, the foreign official. Now, the FCPA's reach doesn't reach to the foreign official in terms of liability, but the DOJ will basically dragnet them in through money laundering, wire fraud, and other mail fraud charges, which they can get to them, and then they'll do one of two things. They'll either pursue those foreign persons in their own right under those charges, or they'll work them. They'll work them and then they'll flip them to get them to turn over evidence against U.S. companies and individuals, and then they'll go burrow down on them. So those are some of the tactics and practices that have been heavily used over the last several years, and there's no reason to believe that the, uh, 
the federal government won't continue to use them going forward. That's really helpful, Scott. I mean, what you're describing is very comprehensive. Um, you use the word dogged. I think that's a, a fair term in the sense that if you're thinking about such a long time horizon, you know, it may be unrealistic to expect that the last number of weeks have fundamentally upended uh, that sort of momentum. And so that's really helpful to hear. Uh, nonetheless, you know, even, even if we think about it in that context, it's still helpful sometimes to think about where we are right now. And so, Julie, if I could turn to you, with that context in mind, we're certainly hearing some you know, fresh or more, more current guidance as well from regulators. And so what are some of the things we're hearing? What's kind of the latest tone? Uh, given that backdrop, where do we kind of go from here on end? Absolutely. So I was uh, actually thinking about individual accountability while Scott was talking, and it's mentioned here at the bottom of this slide. Um, and I was going to start with that, that there still is an emphasis on that, that as DOJ and SEC were unusually active in prosecuting individuals in 2019. Um, so there's still that emphasis on individual accountability going after executives for wrongdoing. And as part of uh, the um, cooperation that companies can show to, uh, you know, lower the penalty um, that they have to actually pay out, uh, there is that disclosing of those that have been, had significant involvement in the wrongdoing. So I just wanted to point out that that trend continues as far as as far as we can we know. Um, and then uh, one other thing that I wanted to point out um, from the past that I think it still very much applies is that we have some guidance um, from the regulators in terms of uh, if the evaluation of corporate compliance programs. And DOJ's fraud section um, has put out uh, some guidance that just what, what they're looking for in terms of a, a sound compliance program. And I just wanted to mention that, um, that they're you know, looking for the company's analysis and reme remediation of underlying misconduct. The conduct of senior and middle management is going to be very much examined. Uh, the policies and procedures of the business, risk assessment, of course, training and communication, that there's a com confidential reporting apparatus, uh, and that the company has designed incentives for compliance and non-compliance, uh, disincentives for non-compliance and incentives for compliance, that there's periodic testing and review of the program to make sure it continues working as the business evolves, uh, and monitoring of third-party relationships. Um, so I just wanted to mention that at the outset. In terms of uh, scams going on right now, uh, it seems like every regulator has jumped into the fray to talk about them, uh, about the trends that they're seeing, so that businesses have no reason uh, not to be on the lookout for them. Um, pretty much every company that I have spoken to has talked about frauds that uh, they're seeing, with phishing being really at the top of the list, phishing emails, um, looking for uh, unsuspecting people to click into what turns out to be malware that's been downloaded on your computer, um, and uh, you know that that seems to be a, a big one. Um, we have a number of strike forces, so we have a procurement collusion strike force that's in addition to the and price gouging task force I mentioned earlier, uh, the fraud coordinator that I mentioned that was appointed, as I've noted. Um, and then Jensen in, in the Treasury Department released uh, something communicating concerns just about, tell us your concern, they're saying to businesses, about any potential delays in your ability to file required Bank Secrecy Act reports. Uh, the agency wants firms to reach out to their regula regulatory support section uh, to do so if they're having any problems fi filing those reports on time or fully. Um, and I think that underscores something that has also come out of my discussions with companies and compliance leadership, which is that now more than ever, they are talking to their regulators, which seems to be a really great uh, best practice pointer, um, to keep your regulators at both the federal and local levels apprised of any delays or challenges that you're having, and to ask them questions. What are your expectations in this area? Um, what if I was able to supply information on this date and more down the road? 
um, you know, the, the regulator is asking for this type of uh, in, interchange and exchange, and I and, and I think that companies are now actually engaging in it, which is which is great. Um, and uh, it goes to another best practice point, which is that you get credit for what you document. So document your efforts and what you're doing to remain in compliance and what you're doing to manage this unique pandemic-related um, challenging environment. Um, you know, that, that, that would provide a lot of uh, defense for you in terms of what methods um, you've chosen uh, that, and showing just your proactive leadership in this area. That's great, thanks, Julie. Um, very, very helpful. I mean, guys, lots to think about here, right? It's, it's kind of refreshing to hear that, um, you know, fundamentally what we stand for and what we're here to do hasn't necessarily changed uh, given this, this context and time horizon, uh, but also, you know, just in the context of these recent weeks, uh, you know, it's just some helpful practical tips to take away. So I just want to be sensitive to the fact that there are a couple of questions coming through the chat. Uh, and guys, I, I just I'll note that we will come back to these, so please hold them and I'll make sure that we come back and address them. I encourage you, please keep asking because uh, it's really great and we're here to help. So um, with, with that in mind, I'm going to go back, uh, Scott, to you. So, you know, okay, so, so we're here now. What does that then mean? What do we need to do? What, what do we need to do differently now uh, with that backdrop? What are the kind of key next steps for us to think about uh, during this time and during this kind of regulatory tone and context that we've just described? Sure. Well, you know, in short, uh, we certainly need to keep pace. And if we're lucky, then we can stay ahead of the curve. Uh, so what do I mean by that? We know that DOJ and SEC, their enforcement is going to remain robust. And in fact, we know it's going to expand. Uh, I mean, we learned that from the 2008-2009 financial meltdown crisis that DOJ expanded after that crisis. There's, there's really no reason to believe that there won't be an expansion of their enforcement um, coming on the heels of this crisis. Um, Kevin, you mentioned uh, what would we do differently. Um, I don't know if I would say it or see it so much as differently, uh, so much as maintaining and possibly enhancing our FCPA risk mitigation essentials, the things we already know, uh, and the basics. Um, it seems simple, but I think it's, it's critical. Uh, you know, Kevin, you'd mentioned at the outset of our uh, webcast about the phrase holding the line. At a minimum, we've got to hold the line. And frankly, I think that's easier said than done in environments and circumstances like this one where there's so much pressure points on cost reduction and cost containment. But in terms of holding the line, just simply the basics. First, you know, have a, have a solid documented internal compliance program. Secondly, you've got to be able to do thorough due diligence on third parties, agents, brokers, resellers, distributors, and the like. And thirdly, if and when you do become aware of potential issues, problems, concerns, whistleblower complaints, you've got to be able to act promptly and responsibly to those possible violations. You can't defer them. You can't kick the can um, down the road. Um, I just think that's going to come back and bite you. I, I, I've seen it too many times. So I think we all know those basics, but I just think we have to remind ourselves that they have to be top of, top of mind. Now, you know, the chart says push back, and that might be, that might be an overstatement for some companies. Um, maybe, maybe that's too harsh, but, but I've seen it. And uh, maybe a different way to say it is that compliance and due diligence maybe gets a little bit lower priority. Um, you know, not everybody likes the attorneys or the auditors walking down the hallway, right? I mean, I've, I've been doing this long enough to know that, um, you know, I'm not always felt uh, always welcome when they see me coming or an auditor comes, but, but we're there for a reason. So my, my watchword would be to, to stay relevant, to uh, press ahead. And here's the bottom line or the reality um, for everybody on the line. The bad guys um, and the regulators, so the black hats and the white hats, enforcement, they're not going away. In fact, you know, so why should you? And it's my belief that there's going to be more bad guys and there's going to be more regulators and, there's going to be, and they're going to be doing more things. So if you merely kind of stay pat, 
much less stand down, you, you run the risk of falling behind. So you have to be really careful about that. So those are some over, overarching thoughts. Um, I, I think there's some, you know, some, some concepts or some questions coming in on selling and purchasing, and can you give me maybe a more real-world real tangible example about how I might think about this new era post-COVID? So <clears throat> we mentioned the mad dash into the global markets for scarce products, right? The PPE, the ventilators, the testing kits, so on and so forth. Now, um, the news reports and the studies are showing that one of the areas that's coming up with the solutions or the answers or we've got them is China. And I don't have to tell everybody on the phone that in terms of the hottest spot in the world for FCPA enforcement for many, many, many years running is China. So China is now the solution where they have all this stuff, either because they've stockpiled it or because they've converted and they're ramping up. So that's where everybody's flocking. And I say everybody, I mean, generally people are flocking into China, the highest FCPA risk location or geography in the world in the, in the wake of this. Now, also, we have to understand that for those watching the events unfold in the news headlines, there is diplomatic fallout between the United States and China. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, we know, I believe, I firmly believe that this current administration will be particularly vi vigilant of and aggressive towards China and China deals. China deals that implicate the FCPA. Now, the example I'm going to give you in terms of the demand wouldn't fit an FCPA scenario because it was actually a state. But I, I'm here in Los Angeles, so I... I'm paying attention to the local news as well, and I see the local politics and the local news headlines. So our, ga our governor here, um, Gavin Newsom, has become very popular with his daily news reports. Well, a couple of weeks ago, um, his office struck a deal with uh, a company in China, BYD, stands for Build Your Dreams. And BYD was a Chinese electric vehicle battery manufacture for cars and buses. That's what they did, and they had factories all over the country. Well, overnight, they converted one of their plants to become, overnight, instantly, the largest producer of N95 masks in the world. And Governor Newsom's office promptly signed a $1 billion contract with them. Immediately, the state legislature and the news reporters wanted the details. Tell me the details. We want to see the terms and conditions in the contract. The governor's office is interestingly very silent on that and said, look, we're looking at end results here. Don't get bogged down in the process. That only, of course, inspired more, more questions. They've now said, well, we'll give you some information in May. That's all to say, and I'm not here to say one way or the other or, or cast any judgment one way or the other about BYD or its operations. I will say this, BYD markets itself is privately owned. But there are many articles and reports in the public domain that express serious concern regarding its deep ties to China's government apparatus. So with respect to state-owned controlled enterprises and that sort of a theory, of course you have to be on your toes when you're buying those kinds of goods. So buyers, sellers, purchasers, if you're going in and purchasing, one of the reasons that they're saying that they, he may not be wanting to talk about it too much is that there's basically a feeding frenzy and there's bidding wars going on out there. And there may be demands being made on certain purchasers to do certain things if you want to buy my product. So you don't have to have a real vivid imagination to know where something like that could go in an anti-corruption or an anti-bribery scenario. So just something to think about. And, of course, that was the government going in, but the private enterprise, private companies, are piling in right behind governments, right alongside them, actually, to buy these goods and these goods. And, of course, right there are the bad guys who are also there in the supply chain. So just something to think about there. Um, that's just a Scott, reminder. That's, that a, that's a help. Yeah, go ahead. It's, 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 a, it's a helpful example because, you know, again, to the, to the question actually, and it's one of these that came through the chat, we're obviously looking at the challenges both on the purchasing side, 
on the selling side, uh, kind of at all corners of the business. So it does confound the, the role, if you will, of the practitioner and having to juggle so many sort of different priorities coming from all directions. Uh, so I think that was a very, very helpful example and hopefully that, that illustrated or addressed in part that question. And if it didn't, by the way, just ping us and let us know. We're happy to kind of, you know, take it offline and, and come back to you if, if need be. Uh, I did want to turn to you, Julie, uh, in terms of kind of where we go from here and next steps because, you know, that's a lot to take in. But I guess I'm curious what, what you sort of see um, for compliance practitioners and how we can manage competing priorities because in some cases there are fundamental business reasons for this, as in we need a specific type of product. We need ventilators, we need masks, uh, we need various medical devices or, or otherwise, irrespective of what sector you're in. Uh, in other cases, there may be those economic and revenue pressures that we talked about. And so again, a lot of different competing business priorities. So how, how, how do we as practitioners uh, juggle that pressure and, and, and manage that expectation? Absolutely. So it does go back to your effective compliance program, although right now the, the challenge is that effective means that it's one that works in practice for your business today and things have changed. The landscape has changed. The challenges have changed. So uh, there's this constant, I think, review of the compliance program and how it can be actually working, can be functional today. Um, one thing that I, I, I just want to point out a few of these things that are on the list here in the slide, but uh, the anti-corruption policies that have always been embedded in a compliance program and should be widely accessible and public, publicized and updated, um, you know, I think another thing that compliance officers can do is to just stress repeatedly that you're available, albeit remotely. Um, you know, you're not right there, you can't walk into my office, but I am available for questions, for bouncing ideas off of, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and I'll refer you to other people if I, you know, if, if need be. So uh, making yourself available. Um, and then, you know, I know Scott uh, talked about bribery and it's different clothing. I just want to mention again that it can take different formats um, from your extravagant charitable donations that would be looked at, um, uh, you know, under a very, uh, you know, under a lens that was uh, scrutinizing those. Hiring and favoritism, hiring the relatives or friends of uh, government officials, even bribes to former, former uh, officials obviously can be considered um, FCPA violations because former foreign officials have a lot of sway over current ones. And your gifts and entertainment that, again, if over a certain limit, if deemed extravagant, can be, uh, you know, uh, FCPA um, red flags. And uh, and then going to your suppliers, I mean, you need an independent review of transactions and contracts, especially high-risk accounts and expenses. Um, you're always doing your general jurisdiction risk, but your contracts need to describe mis risk mitigation practices that you expect your suppliers to engage in. Um, there need to be some specific representations and warranties that, that anticipate corruption risk. Um, and include a range of them, from money laundering, sanctions, and bribery, um, as fraudulent behavior can include elements of several of these. And, uh, you know, to be honest with you, there can be conflicts of interest concerning who is asking for and approving expenditures, um, and that needs to be kind of investigated and top of mind for compliance officers. Um, also, who is double-checking the approver? Um, make, again, keeping an eye out for any conflicts involved. And, uh, and not on the list, but I think is important is considering changing sales targets to de-incentivize de bad behavior during this stressful time. Um, and then do, please don't forget uh, conferring with counsel about your concerns, your board of directors, and documenting your outreach efforts to these people as well um, to keep them informed and to solicit their expertise. Um, to show that you know you are making um, yourself available, but you're also availing yourself of the of these persons' expertise uh, in, in input. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Julie. Um, much appreciated. So I'm going to sort of uh, move forward a little bit, just in the interest of time. And again, I want to save some time in a moment for questions. I really appreciate that some of these are coming through in real time. So please keep them coming. Uh, so Scott, you know, one for you. How does compliance retain a strong presence in this complex environment. So we've talked about the business continuity pressure, the competing priorities. Obviously, the operating environment itself uh, is challenging given we're all virtual uh, or, or many of us are virtual. And then within the confines of environments that are not virtual, there are unique challenges there. 
So we've touched on this a little bit before, but you know, what other sage advice would you offer in terms of how we can approach this uh, during this difficult time? Yeah, and you know, I, on this one, I'm going to kind of just come full circle to some of the things I talked about at the top. But but before I do that, I just wanted to mention that in this environment, uh, we need to keep in mind that in addition to people that are very familiar with this FCPA world and are very comfortable with it and have known it for some time, there's going to be a whole new uh, realm of players, both here in the US and abroad, trying to jump into this game. And what I mean by that is, here in the US alone, we've got 26 million plus unemployed uh, folks. And we have businesses that are distressed, and they're either going out of business or they're pivoting and trying to become something that they haven't been before. And they're, everybody's going to look for demand, right? Employees are going to look for demand, and businesses are going to look for demand. And as they do that, their eyes are going to be drawn to the world markets in terms of doing businesses and deals to bring products wherever they need to be. And they're going to jump in and they're going to jump into the pool, the deep end, head first. And a lot of these players are not going to have the sophistication, the experience that almost all of you on this phone call have. So just kind of a watchword to the wise is your your tools, your um, diligence tool, tools and checklists really have to be buttoned up in this new environment um, to be able to act real time with high speed, uh, especially with these deals going down with, uh, with such a pace. Um, and then basically just kind of bring it home in terms of the strong presence. I, I would just emphasize that uh, the legal and compliance folks really need to you know, get the buy-in and the commitment from ownership and management. They have to continue to invest in the human and technological, you know, AI-type resources to, to make sure you can basically act with, uh, with all, all diligence and speed, remain independent and objective, and, and really stay the course. Don't just try to stay afloat, but stay the course and, and, and push it and, and, and hold the line. Um, we know that the DOG and SEC is going to push forward. Um, we just got to do the same uh, to keep pace. That's great. Thank you, Scott. I uh, really appreciate that. And so, you know, I guess just kind of cup, uh, closing off there before we, we hit the Q&A. So, so Julie, um, you know, in practice, right, next steps, how do, what are the specific actions that we need to take vis-a-vis -vis our programs? Can you make any comments or offer any uh, key tips and tricks in the context of what data tools, processes we use uh, to, during this time and to sort of hold the line in this context? Absolutely. So today's data analytic tools can help you during internal investigations involving offices in far-flung places. You can gather, track, and organize this data from multiple sources while working from your home office, which is great. Um, and gathering this data helps the businesses more promptly respond to weaknesses that are uncovered in uh, any such investigation or audit. Um, and basically, you want FinTech that one, suits your business, and two, help perform the monitoring and risk management, documentation, and audit that the regulators expect of your business, right? And, uh, and then creates a record proving that you've, you've uh, touched on those uh, four things, monitoring, risk management, documentation, and audit. So, um, so those type of FinTech tools, very helpful. Um, and, uh, and training is extremely important. Uh, training for your employees, your contractors, your agents, uh, that they're updated regularly to reflect um, today's challenges. Uh, it takes many formats, but, uh, and, and I say that because some training courses are very formal, take attendance, have a, you know, a 20, 30 question quiz at the end, et cetera, and, and, and you know, track those test scores. Um, but others are just, you know, here's an enforcement action, and this is why we could have fallen into this trap and how we're going to avoid doing so. So uh, those type of informal trainings are just as important. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, they're, again, proof to the regulator that uh, you take all of this seriously. 
Uh, whistleblower hotlines, extremely important. We've been talking about them because, you know, just not to forget to check them uh, and to advertise them. So uh, they need to be very accessible, available to workers in all branch offices, so not just your headquarters, um, and available in all relevant languages, uh, you know, that uh, are pertinent to your organization and where you're located. And ideally available in multiple multiple formats as well. So you've got your phone, online, email, multiple methods if possible. Um, so, uh, so those are the main ones I wanted to uh, mention. Uh, you know, processes for uh, assessing evolving co country partnership risk. Um, you know, th th they can change over time. Uh, examining data about identity ties to governments um, that uh, the person might have. And that helps your regulatory tools will help you with that um, and uh, and meeting linguistic challenges so uh, having these processes uh, you know down and and operating uh, you know is, is extremely important and uh, and proving to the regulator that you have these tools um, available and that they're functional uh, is extremely important at this time that's great thanks Julie so so guys a quick quick announcement. <clears throat> Excuse me. Quick announcement. We're here to help, and so there are there are a number of questions that we will not get to. I'd like to get to a couple, uh, but and for those that we don't, uh, please keep them coming because what I will do is uh, provide a, sort of a contact point after this uh, this call. Uh, email me, email us, and we'll make sure we relay those and get those answers back to you as best as we can. Um, I will say that I know I'm sure I speak for all three of us when I say we're here to help. Where you know if if you're looking at your program. We're evaluating kind of what you're doing in this space. Uh, reach out to us, and we're glad to assist you. Uh, you know, specifically at Refinity, I, I just want to call out the fact that for those of you that are attending this webinar, we are providing for every EDD report or enhanced due diligence report that you'd like to look at on behalf of your third parties. The third parties, we will throw in a second without charge, and so we are looking to accommodate and be be of value to you in any way that we can. So don't hesitate to reach out if we can assist you. Um, I want to just get to a couple of these now. So. Potentially, I'll throw one to you, Scott, and one to you, Julie. Uh, so, 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 Scott, um, any additional guidance that you maybe could share uh, around how we should leverage intermediaries amid COVID-19? You know, anything that we should do differently or think about, and again, uh, when we're using intermediaries of third parties? Well, you just, you, you've got to, be on those intermediaries, third parties, the, the tools are so important, and you've got to be able to move with lightning speed because these transactions are, are happening, uh, you know, very quickly. I, I will say this, uh, beware of, of the aggressive and opportunistic customs agents trying to move products in and out of countries very, very quickly. Um, you know, there are some moratoriums going on out there right now, but that's one of the, uh, the real soft spots uh, is customs, uh, border areas, and those agents, and basically trying to facilitate getting goods in and out very quickly. I would also say, uh, because these transactions are happening very quickly, make sure your customers and clients document those entries and those books and records very clearly. Um, they must be accurate and complete. Um, don't uh, don't uh, gloss over the details of the transactions because you have to be prepared to be audited down the road a year, two, three, four years from now and have all these transactions stand up and be buttoned up. And then finally, Solvency. There, there's a lot of companies kind of coming and going out of business. If your company has an appetite to go out there and acquire transactions uh, during this COVID because companies are hemorrhaging, remember, you can acquire FCPA liability. So make sure you do solid due diligence on the acquisitions and don't let that slide by the, by the side. And if, even if you acquire a foreign company, um, post-acquisition actions by those foreign companies can result in FCPA liability. So be very careful that you pay attention to those types of actions as well. Uh, so keep in mind due diligence um, uh, in the connection with uh, buying and selling companies post COVID in uh, these distressed times. That's great, Scott. And Julie, last one for you. So, you know, there is a question that's come around uh, preset expense amounts uh, and also expense systems that have various triggers if you go beyond certain thresholds. Is that something that uh, practitioners should be reviewing right now? Absolutely. So first of all, it makes great sense to have such financial and country of origin thresholds for transactions and expenses. You want to have those triggers. 
Um, but this pandemic raises a legitimate question as to whether those amounts are now appropriate. Um, so it, businesses might want to consider a more conservative approach, just a slower, deeper dive into these triggers, which might be a good idea until certain supply and demand pressures and supply chain upheaval substantially levels off. So just a, as a consideration, but I would possibly relook at them and uh, and uh, apply a little bit more of a conservative approach to those amounts. Brilliant. Thank you. So guys, again, keep those questions coming. We'll make sure we respond to you offline. Uh, there will be a follow-up email that's sent around after this webinar, uh, just sharing some of the material and next steps that we sort of referenced. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. We're really pleased to have you uh, to, to speak to you today. And we're really excited that you know you're investing in your ongoing learning and we can continue to engage as a community just given the fact that we're not all in a room in person uh, nonetheless to continue the conversation i think is really really important so special thank you julie and scott really glad to have you and i look forward to the next one and i uh, look forward to continuing the conversation so thanks very much for your collective time thank you kevin thanks everybody have a good day thanks Ed. thanks everyone. stay safe guys Be stay well now. thank you